What's up, everybody? I'm the hook, and I'm the blade, and together welcome to this. <laughs> I don't know why I just did that. <laughs> and welcome to the together we are. You know, <laughs> welcome to the spoiler blade spoiler cast, a show about all things spoilers, uh, particularly in regards to Assassin's Creed Valhalla. This is the episode in which we are finally going to discuss what actually fucking happens in the story. Well, it's been two weeks, and luckily this game only takes a hundred years to complete. <laughs> so hopefully some of you, a few of you are done with it. Tim, are you done with it? Yes, I finished everything the other night, uh, clocking in. So just doing all the essentials, pretty much. Just all the essentials <laughs> for the most part. I clocked in at 80 hours, so <sighs> pretty pretty fucking absurd. <laughs> <laughs> 80 hours yeah. for the essentials. Like, yeah. holy shit. I want to say with like about a, a, a reasonable amount of exploration inside content, I, I probably clocked in at 90 hours to finish the story, but I can add a few if we count all the fucking time I spent troubleshooting my game breaking yeah. bugs. <laughs> Little update on that. Uh, technically, no, it's not fixed. I did not get to play the ending on my uh, main save. Basically, I, I held a seance. I drew a pentagram and uh, that allowed my friend Treviso to transfer to my ubisoft connect account uh a save that he happened to have at around the point where i was encountering my uh game breaking bug and so technically i was able to play through the ending um but i'm i have to be specific here because i'm talking only about the ending to the modern day story i never got to play the ending of the order hierarchy because i got another game breaking bug that did not allow me to find and kill the father. So there's that. And that's just two of the several crazy fucking ridiculous bugs I've encountered. By the way, guys, in case you didn't know, uh, when I introduced this as the Spoiler Blade spoiler cast, we are going to fucking spoil shit. <laughs> everything, everything. We're, we're going to start by spoiling the biggest thing. So if you have not finished the game and keep in mind, you may not know whether or not you finished the game. I thought I'd finished the game. And then someone told me because I asked that there was an entire other arc left to do in Hamptonshire. Make sure you finish the game and then we can talk about it. And then we can all talk about it as buddies, as friends, acquaintances, <laughs> colleagues, as fellow Vikings. All right. So the ending, the modern day ending. Here's kind of my, uh, if I were to try and sum up my problems with it in a sentence, <laughs> I would say that it is an ending that is more concerned with being surprising than it is with being satisfying. Yeah, I think so. Cause I definitely was surprised. I, I wasn't exactly <laughs> uh, happy about any of it. I, I, like, I was messaging you while I was going through it and I wasn't being like, whoa, what the fuck? I was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, obviously the centerpiece of the ending, the big point of it is that now our favorite character <laughs> and most fleshed out character, Basim, <laughs> has uh, <laughs> been brought to life in the modern day. Uh, he's kind of an Isu guy, kind of, not really, but kind of. And he's like, I'm going to be using the bleeding effect. I'm going to learn Eivor's skills. I'm going to eventually fight the Templars. Now, there's a lot wrong with this, just on a consistency and plot logic level, when you actually start thinking about it for more than 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, problem number one. Okay. We're supposed to believe and accept and appreciate that Bassam is the new modern-day protagonist, basically. I mean, I guess they could just as easily ignore him from now on, but I, I don't think that they will necessarily. I think the idea that he's the new guy is pretty clear. So why don't we get to know and care more about him in the main game? <laughs> why is he not a more important character? <laughs> why do I feel like I really don't know who he is, especially when he's not very consistent with himself? 
my, my, the biggest inconsistency of this for me, the thing that like I've talked to a lot of people about, and nobody has a really good explanation for, I would love to hear Darby's explanation for this if he has one. Okay. So think about this. Eivor, just like probably Sigurd and probably Bassem, is somehow the byproduct of this process by which certain people in the Isu have propagated their genetics across the future. They've created a descendants almost, or or maybe clones, maybe uh, 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 just, I mean. It feels like sages. It's basically like sages. Sean even says it's the same technology as like what they do with sages. So it's it's not exactly the most original thing. Because in Jotunheim, Hirokin is Juno, and Hirokin is getting the same mead that Odin is, and she's talking about using it to save her husband. So it's the same stuff. They're basically right. sages. That's cool. But Bassem is acting like, at a certain point, like he just is Loki. And I suppose that is consistent with how sages could behave, right? Sages were their own person, more or less. But the more they learned and understood their background, the more they felt like... We hear John Standish and AC4 talking about, like, I'll be reunited with you, my love. Like, okay, so they they kind of feel that, that sure. part of their heritage. But a couple of things. If Eivor is a woman, if Eivor is canonically, historically a woman who looks and sounds nothing like Odin, how can Bassem at once recognize that Eivor is the reincarnation of Odin and not recognize that Sigurd looks and sounds exactly like Tyr? <laughs> yeah, it, with with missing arm and all. Yeah. Well, that the follow up question. <laughs> What's Bassem really looking for? If Bassem is talking to Sigurd and talking to Eivor and, and working with, collaborating with them, because I don't know, Bassem is has a hunch that they are that they are reincarnated the same way he was. What is he actually trying to get? Like, does he think that Sigurd is is Odin? If he spends the whole game thinking Sigurd is the chosen one and Sigurd has these powers and Sigurd has this this lineage. We at least know that he doesn't suspect it's Eivor until their their confrontation because he's like, oh, it was actually you I was looking for all along. How he knows this. Right. But that's exactly the thing. That that choice of words is like, oh, it's you were the one I was right. looking for. So like, is Basim just full on Loki in the in the 900s in 873 AD looking hunting down Odin because he's still mad about his wolf son? And just thinks that this guy who clearly is reincarnated Tyr might be Odin or that it might lead him to Odin. There's really no means by which we're allowed to understand how Basim figures out that it's Eivor in the end anyway. Basim just shows up, just shows up. Like, did Basim know they were going to go there? Does he have the same visions that leads him there? Whatever. He shows up and he's like, aha, <laughs> you, I found you. But how <laughs> and why? <laughs> how and why does that happen? Well, also, it's like, how does he realize it's? I don't get it, dude. Basim spends a lot of time in the story with Eivor. He lives on their settlement. So if if he's like, oh, shit, Eivor is the reincarnation of Odin. Shouldn't he realize that Eivor is seemingly nothing like Odin? And then that it's OK, you know, but he is so mm -hmm. determined to kill Eivor as if that is just for all intents and purposes, that's that's Odin today doing Odin things. It's just, I don't see it. Yeah. I, I would think Bassman would realize like, oh, well, clearly there's, some, there's, there's something about this process that didn't make Eivor one-to-one -one Odin. Oh, and yeah, I mean, that's the other thing too, is that Odin, Odin is visible to Eivor in these visions. That's not how we've understood sages to work. That's not how we're understanding... Basim to work. Basim talks like he is Loki. Basim's like, hey, Aletheia, it's your boy, Loki. It, it's not like he's being influenced by a vision of Loki, at least that we can see. Right, right. And and if he was, it would still be kind of a stretch for him to then be like talking to Aletheia through the staff and being like, ah, the plan worked. It is I, your loved one. I'm, I'm, it's me. I'm Loki. 
And then, you know, Eivor again is just having these visions of Odin and Odin just shows up and he's like the devil on her shoulder. And, and she's just like, Hey, Odin, fuck off. You know, <laughs> like she's not about to start talking to people like, what's up guys. I'm actually the all father <laughs> reincarnated. Yeah. It's Eivor's being, you know, influenced in part, I guess, by her Odin heritage, but she's definitely not Odin. She's, she's not yeah. the updated version of Odin, clearly. It's just, it's all very inconsistent. I have an issue with even viewing, like, Bassam as a victim in a lot of this. Like, I, I don't exactly see Javi as, like, the hero in his story, but I don't exactly figure Lo Loki for, like, you know, the, the underdog either, you know? Sure. I mean, just from our common knowledge of Loki, he's not the best of dudes, so it's difficult for me to be, like, on Bassam's side at all, especially in the context of, okay, it's it, he's he's now the modern-day protagonist. Like, he's already off on a bad foot for me because he just said, fuck you, Layla, goodbye. Yeah. He makes more sense as a modern-day villain than as a yes. modern-day protagonist. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And maybe that'll be the case, but they've put themselves in an odd fucking place by having him also having been the assassin, right? He's the hidden one in the story, more or less. He's like a really high level hidden one. He's, you know, he's on, he's all about that shit. He's all about that life. So he's, the idea is he's popping into the modern day and he's like, assassins, you call them, you know? And he's like, we need to get rid of these Templars. But it's like, dude, I mean, you seem like a huge piece of shit. I, I don't like Templars. I would like to kill Templars. I'm cool with the idea that there's a modern day protagonist now and a modern day story where the priority is to, to end the Templars and we're working towards that goal and we're using the bleeding effect and the animus the way it was originally meant to be used. That's all fine and cool, but the game did not do a nearly enough legwork to make me actually be excited about the idea of Bassam being at the center of all this. There could be a lot with his meeting with William Miles that is telling Watch that shit happen in a comic book, dude. Watch. Just watch. I don't know why we didn't see it in this game, though. And you said it in, in, in a previous episode that if this game doesn't end the doomsday plot, you're gonna be you're gonna be upset. It didn't, not even a little. Um, yes and no. It slowed the machine down, so there's no more like there's no more like radiation, I guess, but she didn't find the solution. It's clearly not a pressing issue. They've probably got a few more years before it comes back. But I guess the idea is Layla's in there with the reader figuring out how to actually end it permanently. Now, okay, I have some issues with that whole thing too. Okay. It's already kind of a stretch to imagine, and I guess they're playing kind of, I mean, is it Desmond? I guess. I guess it's supposed to be Desmond. It's Nolan North, but he doesn't talk like Desmond. He doesn't seem to be Desmond. He talks about Desmond like he's a different person. I'm okay with that being vague because you can just go, oh, it's Desmond and move on. Or you can be like, it's kind of Desmond. It's not. He's in the gray. It's he's a glowing dude. I don't know. The other thing is this, though. Why is it a helpful idea or a brilliant idea, as the reader describes it, for Layla to be like, what if you went back and did calculations from 2012 when Desmond ended the world? I don't get how that is going to help you unless time travel exists. It's not like you can go back and have Desmond make a different choice, you're stuck now with the timelines you have left, right? Like it's all just hypothetical calculations. Like the the sure the, the, the chance that she was going to even get there was very slim in the first place. And so her yeah. idea is, oh well, what if we just plug in this hypothetical scenario that Desmond let the 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 cataclysm happen? And so yeah. what if those people or, or figured out, you know, a remedy for what happened. And so it's it's all hypothetical. Yeah. It, nothing is concrete. But we're going to operate with the assumption that whatever solution that they find and they try, it's going to miraculously work. That's my assumption going forward. Sure. And it's, I mean, that's a fun, it's kind of an interesting way to write Layla out of things. It's kind of an interesting way to to bring Desmond back a little bit, you know, in this sort of strange, interesting way. I Like, I prefer this this. Out, outcome to them just being like, hey, it's me, Desmond Miles, alive in the gray. You know what I mean? Like, that would have been kind of forced. I, I, I do feel like the way that he says Desmond, like, he's like, De like, he doesn't say Desmond in the way of like, oh, Desmond, that's right. I think he says it like he's that I, I think I think they've left it vague enough to where this could be like the like, like the ascension of Desmond. 
right? Like he is Desmond, but he's been he spent so long in this right. simulation, he's forgotten what Desmond was. But are we assuming though that the that the reader has always been in the gray? Like, why is he now all of a sudden Desmond? You know, like or or why is there a reader in the first place? Why is there an artificial intelligence of any kind in the Tree of Life in Yggdrasil figuring out calculations? So obviously, like the whole Asgard stuff is just. Avor's interpretation of, of these like Isu visions. Yeah. Are we assuming that instead of a giant wolf child, which is consistent with like Norse mythology, that it's actually like just a human? Well, so the best explanation I've heard for the relationship between, say, the Aesir and the and the frost giants is that because keep in mind, you know, someone like Juno, who we know is an Isu, is also a frost giant. So it's not like frost giants are meant to represent humans per se. Sure. Instead, it seems like they just represent Isu who were outside of this Asgard bubble of Isu culture. So I guess we're supposed to assume that Fenrir is just supposed to be a son between two Isu people. But then it doesn't really track, for instance, that Odin, also an Isu person, is like, ah, this son you have had is uh, faded in my visions of the future to kill me eventually. It's not like a, a wolf thing. I don't know. It's a little, it's a little sloppy. I don't know. It might be just a, a detail. They had to sacrifice in exchange for having this, this storyline that tracks just as easily onto uh, Norse mythology as it would onto Isu characters and plot lines. I feel like there's a lot of in this in, in, in a lot of this game's Isu development. It's a lot of I don't want to say it's retconning anything, but it's a lot of recontextualization. So now we're going to assume that along with Juno and Minerva, you also have Loki and Odin running around, which I think is fine. I mean, Juno and Minerva are also names of yeah, yeah mythological like of, of gods. like Roman of, of of like Roman gods. But I just. What the anomaly ended up being and everything, I don't know if I was super satisfied with it. I felt like it convoluted a lot of the Isu, like, human war and the solar flare and all that. Well, there's that. definitely something to be said for the fact that part of the story of this whole setup is, like, you know how we've talked at length about how the Isu tried six things to stay alive? Well, here's the seventh <laughs> that we didn't mention at all right. before now. You know Yeah, I mean? like, and, they could, and they could do that infinitely. But keep in mind, considering Juno is directly involved in this plot and and only obtains the mead by way of what Odin is doing, the fact that Juno explaining all of the plots by which people tried to save their lives and doesn't know that this one existed maybe doesn't track really well for me. So I think you're you're onto something there. Like it is convoluting things in a way that makes it far, far more challenging as it goes on to remain consistent to itself. With, with with the anomaly, I was like, "Oh, awesome! We're getting like some first Civ stuff, and, and it's and we're actually getting like new first Civ mysteries, dope." And like, it kind of feels like it's just recontextualizing things that, like, it's it's filling in gaps that I don't know were super interesting to begin with. I I, I don't know. I just I can't I can't quite put my finger on it. There is just convolution. I think that's a fair point because what we have to ask at the end of the day of this whole mystery is what is the dramatic question that this anomaly video was answering. To some extent, there is a question it's answering. It's talking about, I mean, it's contextualizing how these Asgard visions exist for Eivor in the first place. It's contextualizing how Eivor has visions of Odin at all, um, how Eivor is able to, as we play in the simulation, we can switch the genders. It kind of gives you an explanation for that. But I think your point, is not does it answer the question, but did did I, did I care about the question? Was the question interesting? And to some extent, I would say yes. Like I was certainly waiting to figure out why Eivor had visions of Odin in the memory corridors. I was waiting to figure out why Odin or Eivor could switch genders, not because I cared why Eivor could switch genders, mind you, but because Darby and other people on Twitter kept talking about how cool an explanation it was going to be. Um, which let me address that real quick. I said in a previous episode that if the explanation for gender switching was so interesting that it went beyond being a, a just a working backwards from the idea of we need to be able to play as both genders, like if it was so cool on its own that it felt like better to have gender options than to just have a single gendered character, 
Uh, no, that did not happen. It, it's a cool explanation, but it's not so cool that it isn't completely transparent as this was a reason we came up with to let you play as both genders. There is this something about the whole Isu thing that like we are 13, 14 games deep now is still like so awesome because it was it, because it was new information to us. I don't feel like a lot of this version of the truth was necessarily new information. It was, it was just recontextualizing. So, oh, hey, re- hey, remember that? Remember the cataclysm that you saw at the end of Revelations? Well, guess what? In a building next to that, there was Loki. And, you know, it's just like, <laughs> I don't know if that's super interesting. Whereas showing me Adam and Eve getting the apple from the Isu, like that was brand new. Well, okay. <laughs> you know, Let I mean? me comment on that. I think it's a question of what is the priority and what is the uh, the use of the Isu mystery? Because in those early games, it had very little to do with what Ezio was fucking worried about. It was about creating stakes for the modern day story and helping us understand the world of the modern day story. Now we're 13 games in. We know what's going on in the modern day story. We know who the assassins are, who the Templars are, who the Isu were. And we know about that shit throughout all of the fucking history of the world. There's little left to explore. It was shocking and cool and exciting in AC2 when you could see shit in the truth or in Brotherhood about like how they were involved in the assassination of JFK because other than the implication at the end of AC1 that like, hey, the assassins and Templars still exist, you just didn't know to what extent they were involved in most of the pivotal moments of history. That stuff trickles out over the next few games through Revelations, right? That you go, oh shit, they were at the center of every single fucking thing that's ever happened. That's kind of interesting. That was new to us then. Now the function of this Isu story in this game is entirely pertaining to Eivor and the historical story. And I do appreciate that. And I recognize that like, there's not a lot that they're ever gonna be able to tell us about the Isu or the assassins or hidden ones or the Templars or the order of the ancients in a a truth like context. That's going to be surprising or new to us. There's just not a lot they can say about it anymore. It's been explored too heavily, too deeply. Now we just know all the info. So I appreciate that they've taken the idea of having these, these broad mysteries that those games used to have, and they've contextualized it within This is a historical character story, and it just happens to have this, these tendrils of this ancient Isu mystery that are pulling it along. That, that works for me. That's the part that I like about it. What I don't like is that it just doesn't, I feel like, hold up to much scrutiny in terms of making much sense, but also I have problems with Eivor's historical story beyond all this modern day stuff anyway, that definitely feed into how I feel about that. That is kind of what I'm getting at is like it it was new information to us in AC2. And because we are so many games deep, there's just not much mystery that you can provide with the Isu anymore. And so right. giving us a, a truth that's based on the Isu again, there's too little there. I think that what I'm saying is that the priority of this story was not to 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 give you information about the Isu in general or the conflict sure. in general. It was just about giving weight and and motivation to this historical narrative. But that's a great segue into let's talk about why we don't like the historical narrative. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, we've talked at length in the last couple of episodes and on Twitter about how like Avor's story right, is really, really, really long and bloated and full of unnecessary garbage. You know, I talked about how it's all side content instead of main content. That is probably the number one biggest problem because any good storytelling or satisfying, you know, emotional stakes or or emotional impact that might have existed in the Eivor and Sigurd storyline, it just gets... It loses all of its momentum. It just gets the life sucked out of it by this aggressively overlong story. If we were just to examine it on the level of what it is and and what those moments actually add up to, it is not a very well told story. We start the game by having Eivor have these visions, talking to Valka, and, and essentially being told that 
you know, one day you're going to betray him. And then the dramatic question that the entire story revolves around at that point is how will Eivor be driven to betraying her very cool and handsome, nice brother? And the, the answer to that is pretty, uh, <laughs> unimportant because it becomes like, you know, okay, well now Eivor and Sigurd are going to conquer England. They're mostly doing separate shit. And in the two or three arcs where their stories really do intertwine, it's, it's weird to have a story so long also feel so rushed. Like we go from Eivor and Sigurd are best buddies and they love each other very much to the very next arc that we see Sigurd. He's a complete asshole. He is just the worst. He goes from, I, you should bow down to me because I'll be your future king. And I'm, I'm this, you know, first civilization, badass God boy. He, I, like he goes off the fucking deep end immediately. And at that point, well, you've sucked all of the, the question out of the dramatic question. Now it's not about why would Eivor betray Sigurd? I know why Eivor would betray Sigurd. I want to betray him right now. Let me betray him. You know what I mean? <laughs> Now it's just a question of fucking, fucking when, when yeah. will Eivor betray Sigurd? Because I have 40 more map locations to visit and most of them don't involve Sigurd. Thinking about the like Asgard visions and how clearly Javi like kind of fucked over Tyr and made him lose his arm. Eivor doesn't make Sigurd lose his arm. Eivor doesn't betray Sigurd in a way that makes him lose his arm. Sigurd gets captured and Eivor does everything that she could have. To, to, to get him back, if Eivor had made a decision that resulted in Sigurd losing his arm in that betrayal, even if you could say that Eivor is responsible for what happened to Sigurd, give, with the Asgard context, I'm not like, oh, so, that, so that's why Sigurd hates me. What you're getting at, I think, is actually something that I was going to observe as well, where there was a moment in time in this game where I thought it was really smart how... They had the Asgard stories and the historical stories mirroring each other. I liked that there was the loss of the arm that essentially um, you could kind of see the parallels between the character relationships. And I just thought that was all it was going to be was that this Asgard story was going to be this subtle thematic reflection. And so that led to the moment where Basim uh, attacks Eivor for killing his son. My thinking was, ooh, this is really interesting because if Basim is, is, you know, connected to Loki and Eivor is connected to Javi, then it makes sense that as a reflection of that story, maybe Eivor really did kill Basim's son. We know Basim's son died. He talks about it at the campfire, right? Maybe there's an interesting connection there where we didn't even realize, Eivor didn't even realize that someone he killed in some instance was fucking right. the son of Basim and that that becomes part of the story. So once I realize, once it fully set in that like, Basim is just talking about Fenrir. Like Basim is just straight up on crack and thinks he's Loki. And that's all he's talking about. I was so disappointed because like that just felt like the least interesting way right. to have conflict between those characters. And, and so we're not seeing Eivor and Sigurd and Basim repeat that pattern again in this, in this time. We are just seeing... Bastin kind of know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. If we assume that like, oh, Eivor was just doomed to cause Sigurd to lose his arm, then that's, there's kind of like a, a tragedy to that because Eivor doesn't want that. Yeah. And, and exactly as you're saying, like, it would be neat if the Asgard, uh, if the Asgard story was like, oh, so that's why certain things that have happened in the story have mirrored it so, so closely. It's because they're, they're doomed to repeat these things because of their reincarnate of, their Isu counterparts. And and it's in this whole conversation that you have to get to, well, at the end of the day, what theme is the story trying to convey? And of course, as I've talked about many times, you know, you can start to dissect theme by figuring out the arcs of the main characters and where they end up on a, a certain question or a certain issue. And what's interesting is it seems like there are these things that imply certain arcs for Eivor in the beginning. You know, I thought maybe this as, as sort of the full case story was starting to kick off. I sort of think maybe the story was going to be about Eivor learning about the Isu and learning about this thing that is clearly affecting their, her life and that she doesn't know about or doesn't believe in, and that that's going to cause character change and growth. But, like, that never happens. Eivor can be as deep in Yggdrasil, the tree of life, and she'll walk out of that temple being like, well, that shit's crazy, huh? You know, like, 
she's not really interested in engaging with the fact that like she fucking has visions of being or, or interacting with Odin still at the end of the day, she's going to be like, that's all pretty weird. Anyway, on to the next thing. Well, that's the thing is like Eivor isn't really the key to much. They just need no. They just need to follow her to get to Bassam, pretty much. She's not the answer to any to much at all. You would miss out on the Odin and Javi like like parallel and mirror thing. I, I can't help but think though that the at, at the very least the Bassam reveal would have in in that betrayal would have been more realized if we played as as Sigurd or as Sigurd's part in the story. You would lose out on the Odin stuff, but. At least you would spend time with Bassam in Constantinople, and you would spend time with Bassam, whereas with Eivor, hardly ever sees the both of them. Or just rewrite the story so that Eivor and Bassam have to spend more time and work together. Or and that have a character <laughs> relationship. You know, that would be that'd be ideal. But um, something else I wanted to point out is that, you know, at the end of the game, which can I just say, you know, that whole Valhalla simulation part? Yeah. Where you're walking through Valhalla, you kill the people. I've had to play it. About 20 times. Just think about that. You've had to play it how many times? Of all the sections of gameplay to have to replay, <laughs> the one that is a groundhog day of repeating gameplay segments yeah. is the one I had to do 20 <laughs> times trying to troubleshoot my fucking game breaking bug. But anyway, I digress. The thematic statement of the story comes at the end when Eivor is escaping Odin. Odin is trying to draw Eivor to stay in the simulation. All of this is a little weird to me because, okay, why does Odin want Eivor to stay in the simulation so bad? If Odin has tried to propagate his, you know, DNA across time to have reincarnations of himself, why does he now want one of those reincarnations to spend the rest of their life in a VR headset? I'm not <laughs> sure why, but that's because the the story doesn't really care why. They want to create the moment that all of it, all of it is contrived to create a moment where Eivor has to choose family and friends over the idea of eternal glory in Valhalla. This is the game's thematic statement. This is their attempt at saying something profound, is that Odin says, what more could you want than glory? And then Eivor looks behind herself and all of her friends and says, everything else. Everything else. But <laughs> it's not like on any level we were expected to see or believe or interpret that Valhalla simulation as like actual Valhalla. There, like it, it's obvious to anybody that there's no real glory in a simulation of glory. That shouldn't be a shocking or revolutionary idea for Eivor to have. But it's also not about like, okay, if Eivor had to choose between something that would be genuinely glorious, like if Eivor had to choose between something that a, a Norse person in that time would have considered glory, worthy of Valhalla, worthy of being dead now in the real life and sent to live in the, in the hall of heroes and instead said, my life that I'm living right now and the people I care about are more important to me than dying in, in glorious battle. Maybe that gets the theme across that they're trying to get at. But this contrivance, <laughs> this situation that Eivor is in, it doesn't say what it thinks it's saying at all. It's not impactful. I, I have a very similar issue with it. Yeah, the whole her leaving it is not nearly as punctual as they may think because there's... There's nothing about the the place that Eivor even enjoys. She fucking throws a knife in her dad's yeah. fucking skull. She immediately rejects her, her the apparitions of her friends and, and comrades and whatnot. Immediately. If I feel like if they really wanted me to feel Eivor attached to this place and thus her leaving it was impactful, she would have had to settle in. So maybe she reconciles her relationship with yeah. her dad. Perhaps she reconciles like a relationship with a, a, a fallen friend there, and she actually is interested in staying until something happens. But the entire time, she is like, yeah, I don't really know about this place, man. Can we get out of here? Yeah. So rather, you know, I, I feel like um, what they had an the opportunity here to do is uh, as well is, so she settles in and she's like, hey, this, this is actually not too bad. And then her actually having to leave behind 
what she feels is like, you know, this Valhalla situation for the people back at the settlement. It doesn't it doesn't exactly work when she's immediately like, this is lame. I want to I want to leave. Well, there's also the fact that Eivor has always been advocating for and motivated by caring for the people at her settlement. It's not like Eivor spent the whole game being a shitty leader and just trying to achieve Viking glory. No, every decision Eivor has made from the beginning has been what's best for her people. So the idea that at the end, I'm supposed to be blown away by the thematic punch of, you know what? I actually care about my people <laughs> is ridiculous. Well, for all that Eivor knows, that could be what Valhalla is. And there should be something impactful there about her her deciding to leave it behind because for all she knows, that is Valhalla. She knows something's weird about it, but how is she supposed to know that Valhalla isn't actually this mechanical fucking thing that puts you into a an, an, an infinite simulation? For As far as Eivor is concerned, that, could, that is Valhalla. And she's leaving it behind. The, yeah, that you're just saying that maybe Valhalla shouldn't be the clearly shittiest place to be <laughs> well, ever. Well, yes. If, if it was supposed to care that she's leaving. Well, but not only that, though, but, but the whole time, you know, they're always discussing about glory and, and how Valhalla is, is where it's at and where we're going to end up. And, and that's all that matters. Oh, and there's also the fact that she talks a lot about how, you know, there's no real reputation in this. Glory is about reputation. Well, that's still just as like silly as the idea of liking this version of Valhalla, building your entire life and existence about around what people are going to think about you when you're dead is maybe just as silly a pursuit as this simulated Valhalla. So still not getting really a big idea across. I just feel like they could have had a situation where Eivor's entire like pursuit in her life is now challenged. Like for, for all she knows, this is Valhalla and she's there now. Yeah, she doesn't like it. And so now she, now she's like, well, now what? Now what do I do? That could have propelled her to fucking join the assassins or something, you know, like find a different purpose, a better one. Instead of instead of shooting for this, this like if, if this is what I'm yeah. going after, then I don't want it anymore. They could have done that. Yeah, it could have been like if this is what Valhalla really, really looks like, maybe I shouldn't care as much about uh, making it to Valhalla. That could have been interesting maybe, too. It, yeah, and maybe I should care about other things like my like like my clan and like perhaps joining the hidden ones or whatever. Like which right, and and even that would have been underwhelming in the context of this story because again, like she even if she doesn't join, she still is practically a member of the hidden sure. ones and just does all the work for them. And she loves her clan and and defends her clan constantly. So yeah. it's like. There was just there was just no way with the the way that they set things up for Eivor that this particular thematic purpose and direction was ever going to pay off interestingly. It's the same right. thing. This is a, a common struggle with video game protagonists, even some of our favorite ones, like Ezio. Ezio is a pretty flawless dude. But, you know, Darby himself has shown us that you can have Edward, a perfectly understandable and relatable power fantasy type character, and still have a fatal flaw, like in his case being greed. And the, the pursuit of glory would have made perfect sense as Eivor's flaw, but it's not a story about that at any point other than the ending. We just never got the storyline where Eivor, you know, chose personal glory over the well-being of her clan. We yeah. never saw that happen. When, when Dag spends all of his time being upset with Eivor, it rings really hollow because if you're playing the game and you're looking at the story objectively, Eivor has not done anything wrong. Eivor is not worthy of Dag's ire. How interesting would that have been, though, if Dag was actually being legit? If Dag said, you're actually doing things that are wrong and that that here's why it makes sense that they're wrong, or even calling you to task for choices you could have made, choices you could have made that prioritized your glory over the settlement, and then you face those consequences. Then you've given us a character who is actively hurting the people they love in their pursuit of glory. And at the end they go, Oh, you know what? Glory is not as important as my friends. And then that's, that's a classically satisfying character arc. And that, that could have been beautiful. That could have been flawless, but unfortunately not what happened. Yeah. The entire time Eivor is completely selfless and a great leader and, and all this and that. And I never felt like Eivor was ever like, making the 
worst decision possible or the selfish decision. And and that kind of speaks to the inconsistency of Avar's, Avar's character, I feel like, is because she's obsessed with Gori and Valhalla, but also she's like the perfect leader and she's very compassionate and and selfless. And I don't know, like, like, yeah. I, like Ivar was an example of being too focused on glory and 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 being a bad person and being selfish. Yeah, and Avor is none of that. Avor is the an, an antithesis of that. We had the same sort of thoughts about Connor. You know, Connor obviously he has he gets punished pretty heavily, and a lot of things go very very wrong for him. But he never makes a bad decision. He's always in the right. He's always completely justified, and there's no learning or growth that has to happen for him. And, and same thing for Shay, right? Like, like all three of them always are making like the best possible decision, you know, like they're never, they're never yeah. making a, a selfish decision. A fucking Shay is, is deciding to do all this stuff to save the world. I mean, could you have a better justification Re- regarding the choices? I, I, I wanted to talk about, I guess, how you get the good or bad ending. I, I want to discuss that with you. Yeah. It seems to me like there are maybe three tentpole choices. All of them pertain to to how you interact with Sigurd. So, like, if you punch him in the face and you deny Dag Valhalla and you fuck his wife and you that might be it. No. Also, if you if you side with him in the very beginning about keeping dad's money or not. Well, here is here's something funny about that, because I I didn't deny Dag Valhalla, but I did get with Ramvi. I punched him in Bassam in the same conversation. So it, it it gave me three different things: the Ranvi, the punching him, and the refusing to side along with him when he sentences Holger to like pay her for like thirty times the the worth of a sale or whatever. Yeah, and I I think most people probably didn't side with him on that because he was being an asshole. But you know what's really great is he's like, hey, I'm not gonna come back with you, you fuck. And you know what? All it takes is one dialogue option, and I say no, please. And he's like, okay, fine. Is that really the, the the difference between the bad and the good ending is is me was one dialogue option? Actually, Tim, this is interesting. I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. Here's what I think they did. And again, people will probably tell me at the comments if I'm wrong, but this is my understanding. If you make every bad choice, you are getting the bad ending. You can't convince Sigurd to stay with you. But I think if you make even one good choice, you get that that last but the only option. choices that they that they highlighted were the ones that I made the wrong decision for the ones that they're not talking about that I apparently made the right decision for I have no idea that they are impacting this this ending because they don't mention it the the good or bad ending I just think it's also ludicrous that Sigurd is chewing me out for for cheat for sleeping with his wife for punching him in the face <laughs> and for not siding with him when he's giving a uh, a punishment and then, and then all I have to say is, oh, but please. And he's like, fine, geez, I'll come back. That's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. I, if, if you assume that I made one pro Sigurd choice versus three other bad ones, I shouldn't be able to get him to come back with me. All right. So here's what I see. There are five choices in the game that affect what ending you get. These are the Sigurd choices. If you make three choices against Sigurd, he will dislike you and leave England to go back to Norway at the end of the game. If you do the opposite and pick the choices in support of Sigurd, he will like you and stay with you in England at the end of the game. What outcome you get only affects the final cutscene, nothing else. Either way, you still have access to everything. So yeah, those choices are the prologue choice where you can either take the cargo or leave it behind. The the Ron V thing, whether or not you punch Sigurd, <laughs> whether or not you give Dag his axe. And lastly, yeah, the Holger judgment. But I, but I made three bad choices. So why did I get the? Why was I able to get the good ending? Hmm. It, it also look at the end of the day. It's very lame that those choices are what impact the ending for me. Nothing about anything I did otherwise with the alliances and whatnot. Just the Sigurd stuff. Like, is Sigurd coming back with me the only thing that matters? Especially when. He comes home and there's three arcs that I don't even talk to him in. That's so ridiculous. Your relationship yeah. with Sigurd is the focus of the f- maybe first two arcs and then he disappears. That is correct. That's so silly <laughs> that like that is, oh, it is these random ass fucking choices. That, oh, but by the way, I, I meant to mention this to you. Ranvi does mention like the whole like, hey, does Sigurd know about us stuff? Like there is some dialogue options about that. So 
Uh, you were curious. Oh, yeah. We talked, but for context, guys, uh, Tim and I talked about the round V thing because I, when I played this game, I, I think I made every right choice for Sigurd um, because I just, I knew from Odyssey being that it's about a sibling that like, and, and the fact that the whole question is, will will I betray Sigurd? I was like, well, I'm sure the good ending is when I'm, I'm good with Sigurd and the bad ending is when I'm not. So I'm just going to do everything that's nice to Sigurd and see what happens. Which meant as as much as I might have liked to, I did not romance the the best girl, Ron V. I I just I abstained. I was a, I was the better man between Tim and I, uh, <laughs> they, basically, and I refused to cuck my brother. They make it so hard though to be on Sigurd's side about anything though. Like they make it almost impossible. Totally. And so it's like totally, and and that's the thing too, and that's what kind of just sucks the the weight out of it is all right so we go from moment one sigurd is the homie (laughs) moment two sigurd is an irredeemable asshole moment three he's an even more irredeemable asshole moment four he's he's kind of fine now he's all right by the time you're in Hordefilke and he's taking you to the fucking tree of life, it's like none of the shitty things he did or said yeah. ever happened. He's like, Eivor, I'm sorry I was such an asshole to you. Let's see if I was telling the truth about my visions. And it's all visions. on Eivor's shoulders because it's like, Eivor, I can't believe you slept with my wife after I, you know, f- was a terrible brother to you this entire time. You know, it's like <laughs> it's all on Eivor's shoulders as if Sigurd did nothing. Like, that's that's so annoying how, how Sigurd could could call you ugly and, and push you to the ground. <laughs> Spit in your yeah, coffee. And, and you have to just be like, thanks, Sigurd. And that's how you get the good ending. But fuck off. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. Ultimately, yeah, if I actually cared about Sigurd because the game didn't go out of its way to make me fucking hate him for a good majority of his <laughs> me- m- meager screen time, <laughs> maybe it would have been actually important to me that at the end of the game, I'm like, all right, Sigurd, you're staying with me. Instead, he stays with me, he makes me the Jarl, and I'm like, well, now I just live with this asshole. I didn't want him to come back with me, but I also didn't feel like it'd be, it would be right for me to leave him in the fucking temple. So I was like, oh, okay, okay, go. <laughs> like, I was pitifully just like, all right, come back. Come on, please. It's just, <laughs> Come on, buddy. We'll, we'll figure this shit out later, I guess. It's also like, it's just so absurd to me that like the good ending is, the ending is not at all a consequence of any alliances that you made, any decisions that you made within the alliances. No, and that's what's so fucking ridiculous about the fact that you after this huge you know modern day ending that feels so conclusive they have this whole other arc in Hamptonshire and it's as if even if I did somehow care about the idea of pacifying England there was no way that final quest was going to be interesting to me after everything yeah else. like yeah totally we've just had the Sigurd plot resolved the modern day plot resolved now this ending about we're going to take on King Alfred that shit just did not matter to me and then I see, okay, Soma dies. Well, I haven't talked to Soma in 80 hours. <laughs> Hunwald dies. Okay. I haven't talked to him in 50 hours. <laughs> I haven't talked to him in 50 hours. They were fine. They were fun characters, but I, it's not like watching Blackbeard die. And they try and emulate that with Soma. They give her a Blackbeard moment, and yeah. it's like, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Who are you? My favorite thing, too, is that at the end, once you finish that arc, you get a little pop up that says, "Congratulations, you have pacified England." Yeah, what a slap in the Fucking face! I spent I? eighty hours doing that, and you gave and you give me a little pop up. Congrats, you pacified England. I'm allied with everyone now. So what? What was I actually working towards? I thought the whole goal of Raven Clan in England was to conquer England. That's what they always talked about. We need these allies so that eventually Sigurd can be the king of England. We know that's not going to happen. So that's another dramatic question of the story is that, okay, well, clearly this gambit to, to conquer England is going to fail because we know there's never been a King Eivor or a King Sigurd, right? But instead they (laughs) succeed, but only kind of, they succeed, but, but okay, well, instead of anyone being King, instead of Raven clan being the fucking capital of the, the country, uh, instead, we're all just friends now, really. We're allied with everyone. Well, okay, is everyone allied with everyone else? <laughs> are are my allies friends with my other allies? Like, what happens when two of my allies start fighting? Is England still pacified? Because it's going to happen. I have 20 allies. You think they're all going to get along? Yeah, I mean, the whole, like, 
oh wow, look at all my allies moment is kind of pitiful because because it's a pop up that says you have pacified fucking England. You didn't get you you didn't make any choices to to get them to to, to come to this battle with you. You just did what the game told you to. Yeah, like every everyone is going to have the same people there because you can't choose between one region or another. You can't make any choices within those arcs at all. No, and like of course the ensuing battle really doesn't matter. Because what allies you bring to it doesn't matter. Soma's going to die. Uh, Hob- Hobgoblin's going to die. <laughs> it's fucking whatever. King Alfred gets away. Go buy the DLC, you fuck. Fuck yeah. off. Just ugh. Now, uh... <laughs> one last battle to accomplish nothing. <laughs> <laughs> one last battle. I'm going to... I'll give my life and my friend's lives for that pop-up that tells me I've pacified England. <laughs> Look... I think that the best approach for this game would have been, you know, give us the same arcs if you want and the same shitty, stupid fuck off number of them. But like, give me, you know, give me two arcs, right? One right after the other, where then I have to choose which one I ally with and, you know, repeat that process through the game so that eventually I only am allied with half of the people and we have to fight the other half or we have to fight King Alfred together. And maybe those choices based on the, the, the quality or strength of their leadership or the sizes of their armies or other strategic considerations that I, the player would have to think about. Imagine that me playing an Assassin's Creed game and thinking about something. I know if that had to happen, I could have actually given a shit about the ending of that, that story. I could have actually felt invested in how did my choices pay off? What did this get for me at the end of the day? But this game really isn't interested in any creating anything meaningful. It is interested in stringing many, many repetitive, nauseating tasks that mostly revolve around the game's incredibly fucking stupid combat system. And, and, and all for the purpose of what? Well, now that England's pacified, we can we can wait patiently for those DLCs where we go to fucking Ireland or Paris and we, I don't know, are we going to pacify that shit? Is that what's going to happen? Is that what we're supposed to care about? It's like, gosh, wouldn't it be cool if they just gave me a reason to care about anything in this game? There's definitely like also I feel like a problem with there just not being like a single antagonist. I mean, how could there be with a story this size? But. You know, King Alfred, I guess you could say, is the protagonist. Uh, antagonist. Fulke Not- was a fun villain. But it's like... I enjoyed Fulke's presence. The fact that, but, like... You know, then she was gone. Okay, conquering England, whatever, like, that's the goal. But if if the goal started to become, like, go kill King Alfred or go take his crown, then you have a tangible goal that you can work towards. But if I'm just trying to put my little raven sticker on on every region of the map, then... I'm just going there, talking with new people, and then I leave. That's it. That could potentially isolate me from other re- from other a- alliances if I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to kill King Alfred. And they're like, excuse me, well, I don't really want to kill King Alfred, Eivor. It, it's a question of how well does this game achieve what it was setting out to achieve? Does it capture the feeling, the emotions, the the game feel, all of that that it was setting out to? I think the answer is no. It's It's also just really just shocking to me that in a game that's all about yeah, you better get those alliances. You better go conquer England, and that the and the and the ending is actually all about if you punch your brother or not. What the fuck? <laughs> and you know what? They couldn't have done an ending where it's like, "Hey, I I hope you got all the good alliances," because you don't make any choices with the alliances; they just happen. You know, it's like yeah, seeing Soma show up at the end of the battle. It's like. Great. Uh, every other player had this happen. Even if you fucked up with Soma, even if you made the wrong choice, you got one of the people she loves most in the world to die. She still shows up. With, she still shows up. And she's still going to show up for you in the end of that battle and be like, you know what's going down. We're, we're homies for life, me and Eivor. Yeah. It's Guys, just- I'm, starting, I'm starting to feel like maybe Valhalla is not a very good game. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I know that you like black flag but i'm still just over here saying that revelations is the best darby story and we haven't gotten one like it since i don't we probably won't at this point i mean that's that's fair so here let me let me put a button on my whole experience with this game this is something that amuses me now like i said you know i borrowed a save from treviso it allowed me to experience the modern day ending then i killed the the few ancients that were left on his hierarchy and I went to go kill the, the, I went to go track the final target and it just didn't work. It was another game breaking bug 
that just I did not get to experience the ending to the hierarchy story. I did eventually cave and watch it on YouTube. Then as you know, I was getting ready this morning and, and you know, playing some Valhalla to try and just get back into the headspace. Not that I've been gone from it for too long. It's a fucking hundreds plus hour game. I've been playing it like it's my like my life depends on it for the last two weeks. <laughs> I heard on Twitter that something really interesting and cool happened. If you went to all the bureaus, Tim, do you know about this? No, no, I don't. So if you go to all six bureaus and you collect all the codex pages and you bring them back to Hytham, something cool is supposed to happen. That's what I was told. Something, something that was like a nice moment. Uh, I, I heard maybe a particular voice actor was involved. Maybe we we're going to get a, you know, a flash forward or a flashback of something interesting. I was, I was like, you know, I'm just, I'm going to get on to Valhalla. <laughs> Oh no. I'm going to go to the last remaining bureaus I have to find and I'm going to get this because maybe this will be the closest thing I get to <laughs> an ending that I get to genuinely experience on my own save. So I do that. I go collect the pages. I take them back to Hytham. Hytham's like, hey, you know, these the the writing in this kind of reminds me of, you know, that merchant boy, Reda. Are you shitting me? He's holding, he's got a scrap of paper with some words on it you might want to look at. Oh no. Oh, it gets worse. So I go over to, to Retta and he's like, oh yeah, I was friends with this guy named Bayek. And I'm like, uh-huh. Uh -huh, oh uh -huh. no. No, 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 no. Just wait. Just wait. <laughs> I go to read the letter. I press the triangle button. Read. It's a letter. That's it. It's just a letter. Now, let, let me be clear. I thought at this point I was going to hear Bayek do a speech while I'm reading this letter. And that that was going to be it. I'm just going to hear Bayek. But I don't even hear Bayek. I'm just reading a letter. And I'm going, well, hold on. What is so cool about this? <laughs> because it's Bayek, dude. I, I had to get here by reading six codex pages, some of which quote Aya directly. How's this any cooler <laughs> than that? So I'm a little suspicious at this point. I go, you know, what the fuck? I Google the the, the shit on you. I look it up on YouTube and I go, is there supposed to be a mm -hmm. buying voiceover that I'm just not hearing? Mm -hmm. Yes. When you go to read the letter, uh. you're supposed to hear Abzi Babzi, Abu Bakar Salim, <laughs> read the letter as Bayek. And that's what was supposed to be so fucking cool. But I couldn't even have that. <laughs> I couldn't even have that. I couldn't hear in the game naturally by myself, Bayek read the fucking letter. I had to read it with my eyeballs like a chump. And that, <laughs> that is now the, the, the third ending of sorts that I was supposed to have in this game that I just, that is broken in its own unique and special fucking way. <laughs> Fuck this game. You know, just as a little aside, uh, speaking about returning voice actors, there's no fucking way that, that, that it doesn't. Uh, there's no way that that's Roger Craig Smith in the Asgard section. But where, when, when, when was Roger Craig Smith in the Asgard section? I'm saying there's no way that it was Roger Craig Smith, but they, it was supposed to be. Is what I'm saying. Who? What do you mean who? <laughs> when <laughs> they literally you, you you go and uh griffledor the fucking uh the guys the the she she has the big mirror yeah and she's like prophet are you there and it's like who are you and it's supposed to be Ezio. it is who who are who are you i'm trying to do i'm trying to do how they do it <laughs> that was that was supposed to be Ezio. dude I don't totally think the portal said anything to me yeah it was like it like she says, she says prophet you know it's just and then it's like they, they walk. She's like, uh, I guess he's not awake today. And then, you know, and then Etsy was like, who are you? <laughs> oh, my God. You should have seen it. I want to I want to watch it on you. I'm trying to pull it up. You should have seen it. I remember what you're talking about. There's no way that it's Roger Craig Smith, though. It's for you're saying fucking... it just isn't. It just doesn't sound like him. It's it. It's like it's like if you were me did an Etsy impression. It sounds better than the show you. <laughs> <laughs> what's the chick's name what's the what's the frost giant lady's name she was kind of cute griffledor guand guandalore G gwen gwen gwilador <laughs> let me look it up it's like it's like gwen gwen stefani <laughs> <laughs> gwen 
Gwenpool? <laughs> I can't find her name anywhere. Playing as Ezio in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I, I don't think so. <laughs> you have sex with her. You have sex with her. Apparently, yeah. Anyway, so I mean, who else? Who else? Who else <laughs> would? Who, what is it supposed to be? If it, it, it's at, at first, it, because it wait. It, what's up, guys? And <laughs> perfect. Hold on. <laughs> who? Who are you? <laughs> All right, I'm it's close. It's totally Ezio. It's supposed to be at least. And I, I, I remember it. hearing the voice, and I was like, "Who was that supposed to be?" <laughs> And I, I, I like went back and I tried to interact with the portal, yeah. hoping something interesting would happen. If it really is just like Roger Craig Smith saying, who are you? And like, <laughs> that was the best they could fucking do for that. I, I, I kind of hate it because just leave Ezio alone. Just leave him alone. Leave him, leave him there. Leave him in his Assassin's Creed prime. Okay. Okay. Gun loader. Gun loader. That's her name. That. Yeah. Gun loader. <laughs> Ragnarok. I thought she was kind of bad, not going to lie. He sees no profit in it. But I am not yet ready to give up. I leave them words, little packets of possibility, waiting for unknown ears many ages hence. Oh, you know what, though? Okay, is that Minerva? She literally is creating the messages for Ezio to look at in AC. But we, we already knew that. <laughs> All right, I mean, I, I got to hear this Ezio voice. <laughs> they speak of things to come. I was not making the connection to to the fact that that's what Minerva was doing. But and even it, I didn't realize Gunloader was Minerva until now. He cannot turn the tide of Ragnarok. Can you hear me? There you go. It happens. It, they walk Shh. away, and it happens. Shh. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Yeah, that's not Roger. That's not him. It's definitely supposed to be Ezio. Yeah, you're right. It is. We fit. We answered the question. We. I hate it, it. Just leave Ezio alone. Leave him alone. Also, why did I feel like there should have been a moment now in like AC two or something where like just Minerva just pops up for like one <laughs> moment and then he's just like, "Who are you?" And they never speak of it again. Yeah, he's like, he's he's yeah he's he's a uh, fucking Christina. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, "Who are you?" You and brought she's a like, friend. <laughs> Oh my god, dude! dude. Uh, just that, just, just I have to say this on the podcast though. Asgard and Jotunheim are the are the best thing about this game by far. That's all. I, that's all I need to you say. You know, I hadn't been thinking that before, but I have kind of come around to accepting that somehow it's like the most <laughs> story relevant part of the game. Somehow more happens in Asgard and Jotunheim that actually builds towards a conclusion that actually you know, creates plot information that's meaningful to me than the rest of the 60, 70 hours of gameplay in England. Yeah, totally. Somehow. I, I initially was like, no, Asgard was stupid. I didn't like it. It didn't mean much. But at the end of the day, you're completely correct. So, yeah, I guess the whole idea of Asgard is that they're, it's all the Isu and there's just how he's interpreting. And so that was Minerva, you know, Juno was Herokin and the other chick was Aletheia and <sighs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. You know, you know what? It's fine. It's fine. But even, even just as like, I kind of like it, you know, indulging into like the Norse stuff and the, and the Asgard stuff, like just that on its own, it's, it's actually very palatable because I don't give a fuck about Asgard stuff. And I, and I enjoyed the Asgardian stuff that was in there my frustration with the Asgardian stuff is because I feel like that, that that there's something to the nature of myth that's like so random and strange that I just if it's hard for me to hold on to things like for sure like okay now Loki's really upset because he banged a frost giant and they gave birth to a wolf and that shit just doesn't make sense to me I'm like why is he a wolf and all the prophecy stuff like it's just all very kind of like it has the sensibilities of an actual myth, which I appreciate about it, but also makes me hard to actually care about the idea that Javi is trying to, uh, is this arrogant bastard who's trying not to get got by the apocalypse. Uh, you know, I didn't really like care that much whether or not he succeeded for instance. Yeah, it's fine. It was interesting. I guess it was interesting. It was more interesting than most of yeah. the England. I, I, I gotta say too, in terms of like the best, like actually like, Oh, this is Darby, you know, like cutscene is 
actually bash them around the fire with Eivor. Yeah. Like I felt like yeah. I felt like the performance was great. Everything everything about that was great. And it was like a little it was like a little glimpse into what this game could have been if it wasn't unimaginably long and bloated. Darby does well with distinct characterizations. Like he's he's always across all of his games good at making characters unique and interesting and likable. Like that's something he can do in Revelations with, you know, uh Suleiman and Yusuf. That's something he can do in Black Flag with Hornigold and Vane and Thatch and Steed. And certainly that element is present in Valhalla. Uh, there's certainly a lot more distinct characterization with, you know, Sigurd and Dag and and some of the people he meets, even Soma and Hunwald and Halfdan and Ivar, all of them are very Darby characters in that sense, where it's not like you're playing Odyssey or Origins and it's like fucking Socrates or Barnabas and they're just a bunch of fucking jokes or or Origins where Cleopatra and and fucking Caesar are about as boring as you could possibly imagine. They're they're recognizable distinct characters, but where where Darby I think did not come through in this game was creating a story with momentum and character arcs and stakes that actually mattered to me uh like he did in those other games i mean in, in black flag i cared about edward in revelations i cared about Ezio. i just don't care about avor that way avor does not earn that level of empathy and investment in this story i want to say that like a solution would have been like oh we'll just play as sigurd or or play as Bassam, but really there was no reason why avor couldn't have seen these things happen it was just the inconsistency of the story that that made that happen. The fact that you don't even speak to Sigurd for like three arcs after he comes back to you. Kind of absurd. Who decided that like they should just make all the side content main content, that they should just make a game this long? Like who said in the creative process, what if we had 24 memory sequences and they were all three hours long? Like why, why did that happen? I, I, I don't feel like I got anything beneficial from that process. I I, no. I really just felt like I, I enjoyed the story less. If there was one thing that you're going to make me like feel like playing through your story is a chore is to make it with all the essentials 80 fucking hours long. Yeah. That is ridiculous. And if, and if I blew past the anomalies in Asgard, guess what? I have no fucking context to go off of anything. And if even, ha yeah, that's the other thing. I pointed this out on Twitter and, and I should say this again here. If you just miss the anomalies, you don't do them or you decide not to do Asgard, you literally will not understand the ending of the game. Now, I can get the logic that someone working on this game would say, well, that's all main content, so you can't really be upset that you don't understand the story if you don't finish all the main content. And I think that's probably why it's all main content, so that there is an obligation that if you come out of the main story ending and you go, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, that it would be partially your fault for not doing everything in the game. But when so much of it feels so inessential, like if I can play a main arc in the game and have it be entirely throwaway and add nothing to the plot, how am I then supposed to believe that by fucking off to Asgard or grabbing every mystery collectible that I'm going to have a meaningful experience? Yeah, if you tell me sure. your main content isn't really that good, and then, well, you should have done all the main content to understand the story. It's like, that's not my fault. That's not on me. But at the same time, it really fucks the pacing that, yeah, I could reach the Basim revelation in the main story and never know about Loki or know about what the fucking Isu people did. And then I would just be going, whose who's son, what, what son did Eivor kill? When did Eivor kill Basim's son? And I can, I already told you this, if that had happened to me, if I wasn't told by someone, thank you, Noah and staff 13, that I needed to go <laughs> myth worlds followed by anomalies followed by Sigurd ending. If no one told me to do that, I would have blown through the main story, seen that whole scene with Bassam. I mean, well, just kidding. I wouldn't have seen it because my game would have still been broken. But if I had, I would have Googled it. I would have been like, what, what did I miss about Bassam's son? What, where did I miss that part? Yeah. And then when Googling it, I would have been spoiled <laughs> on the Asgard story. Let's just say hypothetically you played as Bassam in this game. I feel like you could have had like a would you kindly type ending where it's like, holy shit, like Eivor is my mortal enemy somehow. And, you know, speaking on that, I do feel like there was the opportunity 
especially with a lot of the Asgard themes that were going around while you were there, there was the opportunity to do like an overcoming of, of fate kind of story here. Yeah. Eivor, like, because Eivor has autonomy and Eivor is an actual person, not just Odin 2.0, she is able to overcome the fate of, of, of having to die and betray Sigurd and, and even maybe to, like, betray Loki. Like, there could have been a, an, an ending here where you can, can patch things up with, 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 with Loki in a way and, and where you overcame your programming to betray Sigurd. I feel like that could have been a thing. I don't know how you feel. To some extent, it seems like they're not even trying to say that you could have overcome fate because what's funny is even if you'd get the good ending and you never betray Sigurd at all, you'll still have this conversation where, where Eivor's like, I guess in a way I did betray you by, yeah. I don't know what it is. She says it's like second guessing your leadership or not letting you have the glory and, and pursue yeah. the dream that you mm -hmm. want. And it's like, that is the kind of mental gymnastics that, that I see people do when they read a horoscope that they're like, Oh, well, my horoscope says I'm yeah, going to meet someone. Sure. <laughs> and then, Oh, I had a pleasant interaction with my barista at Starbucks. So I guess I kind of did meet someone like you're just retroactively recontextualizing yeah. the events of your life to fit a prophecy that never existed or had any power. And that's fine. I was expecting the big emotional betrayal moment to happen. I was waiting for it the whole game and I'm kind of glad it didn't because that would have just been too predictable. But predictability isn't inherently bad. If I'm seeing it coming, there's a tragic irony to it that if they can make it so that when it happens, I'm choosing to do it or I want to betray Sigurd, then that's a little bit more interesting than if I'm forced to do it and I don't want to or, or what have you. But it's still just not something this game is really interested in doing. That's what I was suspecting was going to happen was that like you were bound by fate to betray Sigurd somehow and then you overcome that and, and choose not to or maybe choose to and then you become Odin 2.0 and you're a jackass. I don't know. It's 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 also difficult for me too because the the Bassam part of the historical story completely ends with him being a like a jackass and a villain. So yeah, it's hard for me to then be like, oh, well, he's totally cool and handsome in the modern day now. You know, so yeah. I understand that you needed Bassam to stay in the temple forever, but I I don't know. I would have liked to see maybe like, I don't know, maybe Bassam fucking just realizes that his fucking life purpose of killing Eivor isn't actually what he wants. And he just plugs himself into the fucking machine and stays there for eternity. I don't know. Can someone explain to me how the whole staff thing worked? Because... So, so is he just, he's in the simulation and that's his corpse up there. It's super dead. And he's just like, all right, release me from the machine. <laughs> he does. So then he falls. He, yeah. He happens to. So if, if Bassin's corpse didn't land directly on the staff. <laughs> it it would have been fucked. Would he have just stayed there dead? Yes. His whole plan was to fall on the fucking staff in a, in a position. <laughs> in a position. He was hoping that Layla dropped the staff <laughs> to where he could fall onto it and use it. That was his, that was his whole plan. <laughs> Because he basically did, he was like, all right, I'm out of here. I hope I fall on the staff or else this is all <laughs> fucked. <laughs> Alethea, the plan worked. I also like now the implication that it doesn't just keep you young. It actively makes you look like your young self, which is inconsistent. Because again, when you meet Pythagoras, he's old as shit. I don't know if it's just the implication that. No, it wouldn't. It still wouldn't make sense. It's not like Pythagoras found the staff when he was old, so it kept him old because Bassam didn't ever touch the staff and then he touched it as a corpse and it made him young. <laughs> well, well, uh, but uh, Cassandra wasn't old when she had it. Right. But Cassandra was young when she found. Yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. So my question is, why is Pythagoras a wrinkled <laughs> ball sack holding the staff? Maybe he had it for a very. I don't know. I don't know, dude. <laughs> He only had it for 150 years, and Cassandra still looks 23 when she brings it to Layla in the present, thousands of years later. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Also, I don't. I'm not convinced that I like Layla at all. So, Darby, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think she's particularly. Likeable. I don't think she's you made me like her. She's not as actively unlikable as she was sure. in Odyssey. Even though I appreciate that they said let's give it some apocalyptic stakes again because it definitely needed that shit. I don't appreciate that it did that by saying, oh, you know that apocalypse we thwarted in 2012? It's back. 
It's the it's the modern day storytelling mm. equivalent of when Oscar Isaac looks in the camera and says, somehow Palpatine has returned. I thought you were going to say, they fly now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I just thought that you were gonna, I, I, I wasn't sure of the correlation there, but <laughs> <laughs> they fly now. <laughs> All I'm saying to you, Lawson, is for all we know, she could have relinquished ownership of the staff and put it in the little box and then took the ownership back when she went into the cave. That's all I'm saying. Oh, that's possible. Anyway, I've, I've been the hook. <laughs> Guys, thank you for going through this journey with us. If you love Assassin's Creed Valhalla, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry we shat on the thing that you loved for the last hour and whatever it ends up being we've been recording for almost two hours now we'll see how it ends up actually coming out on the episode uh i would like you to say nice things about us in the comments and on twitter at hookblade uh it would be really nice of you to do it would that. It, it, it would be lovely if you did that it would be very pleasant delightful it would really really turn around the bad experience of having every single ending in valhalla be broken for me Anyway, <sighs> fuck Ubisoft, fuck Darby McDevitt, maybe fuck Assassin's Creed Valhalla. <laughs> maybe the next, uh, maybe the next Darby game will be good. <laughs> <laughs> they fly now. Well, I've been the hook, guys. Uh, just Assassin's Creed's over, man. I, I just, I've been the blade. Uh, All right. Well, we will see you next week. <laughs> My parents have entered the room. Hello. Well, then I'm going to listen. You can talk to me. All right. Well, we will see you next week. <laughs>